And we're live. It is uh, Wednesday, August 26th, 5.03 p.m. We had minor technical difficulties. We are 69 days from the election, 147 days from Inauguration Day. My neighbor is uh, plowing his field. So if you hear a tractor in the background, that's what it is. Um, yes. I have the same problem in New York City, Ben. You know, there are uh, many problems uh, that produce noise that interfere with in lieu of fun when I'm at the cabin in the woods. One of them is the tractors. One of them is the shotguns, which you will occasionally hear. Uh, there are cicadas. Not to, be in, not to be confused with the baby cannons. Correct. And mm -hmm. there are, most importantly and disruptively, occasional loud mooing noises, which are, in fact, cows. You guessed it. Um, so, I was going to say, this sounds like friends. Yeah, exactly. Can I just say, if you hear any shotgun noises here, actually, please call 911. Yeah. <laughs> uh, at the cabin, uh, uh, loud uh, uh, gun noises are pretty normal and pretty uh, unobjectionable. They generally have a legitimate purpose. Um, okay, um, I just want for everybody who has been asking for deck picks, and I use that term advisedly, here the deck is almost entirely done. Hey, and Nisha, here hey, is the remaining hole that I'm still <laughs> working on. But as you can see, the remaining hole is very small. Uh, so uh, I ho hope to have it done within the next 48 hours. And then there's one other little piece of deck that needs to be done. And then the deck will be done and we'll have uh, completed deck picks. Um, this is the only show where you can go to have deck picks that are entirely <laughs> legal in every state um, and of precisely the sort that Anthony Weiner would never send to anybody on Twitter. We I are... just want to say that if you fall off screen suddenly to the right, we will also call 911. Like we hear shotguns and they're coming from Rick. Like we hear like, like we just see you disappear. Then like I'm just calling, I'm calling an ambulance. There you go. We are not allowed to have fun anymore. <laughs> but in lieu of fun, we have Rick Pildes, NYU law professor and uh, uh, one of the, uh, the most diversely interesting law professors around. I promised you all a fun story about Rick Pildes, which was actually how we met. And I'm not going to uh, let you down. Hmm. It was I was supposed to ask about this. I have no memory. Know. I don't know what's coming. No, you have no idea. And there's no reason why this incident would be memorable to you. But it was memorable to me. It was the first time we met. Um, and uh, I had been invited by... I'm going to keep all of Rick's colleagues' names out of this. Because this story <laughs> could be embarrassing. Uh, or at least should be embarrassing to several of them. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use it to be flattering to Rick and unobjectionable to his colleagues. So um, I was invited by one of Rick's colleagues to uh, give a talk on one of my books uh, at um, NYU Law School. And what I didn't know about this invitation was that it was basically, you know, the uh, murder hornet invitation to the queen bee of a neighboring hive to come over for some uh, for, you know, like a brief chat about territory or something. Um, and uh, it was the most hostile audience I have ever addressed. Um, and we sat law, around the table. Law professors are famous for this shit. Yeah, <laughs> it was, uh, we were, we sat around a conference table. It was all really polite. And the questions were aggressive and mean and, uh, I would say uh, the nice word you could use for them was challenging. The uh, less nice you could use for them was 
really mean and uh, savage. And it was definitely, as this thing heated up, it was definitely, it was increasingly apparent to me that this was an effort by uh, 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 people uh, to uh, uh, see whether I could take it. Um, and um, so every new questioner, I was uh, kind of nervous about, like, who would this person be? And if they said something nice, what would be the, uh, like, what was that the smile in anticipation of jabbing the knife between your ribs kind of thing? And so over uh, sitting against the wall uh, uh, was uh, Professor Pildes, and uh, he uh, greeted me with an impish grin and said, so Ben, and he spoke very slowly, so I was kind of, um, he said, I, I just want to thank you for the non-political fashion and the uh, 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 non-partisan fashion in which you have sought to address these issues. And these were uh, counterterrorism issues. This was at the very end of the Bush administration or the very beginning of the Obama administration. And he went off on this uh, fairly long impish soliloquy that was all... <laughs> Um, I like the double use of impish. I yeah, no, no, what? it was. I, I no. You know, the, the, my age, that's a that's a compliment. It, it is was, a compliment. This was, a years ago, this was in two thousand eight or nine. I can't remember. There are a lot of other was. ish words that um, he could have used. <laughs> and uh, it was um, it was before lawfare actually, um, and uh, it was framed, not framed at all as a rebuke of colleagues uh, for being, shall we say, inappropriately aggressive. It was framed as, uh, as a cheerful commendation of um, the way I uh, tried not to be political about counterterrorism counter matters uh, and thereby sometimes antagonized people. And, um, and then proceeded to ask a really interesting question about congressional authorization and counterintelligence questions and single-handedly changed the tone of the entire conversation. Um, and I have, I appreciated it enormously at the time. Um, I've never been able to tell, I never known whether it was, uh, 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 I'm gonna use the word impish again, uh, uh, just an impish desire to say, hey, cut it out to uh, a bunch of people around the table, or whether it was um, uh, uh, done entirely naively, but it uh, amused me a great deal at the time, and we have been friends ever since, though sadly out of touch. Um, I haven't heard from Rick in a long time or been in touch with Rick in a long time, and it is great to see your face and welcome to In Lieu of Fun. Thanks for that. That was that, that was worth the price of admission for me being reminded of that. And actually, as you tell that story, I do conjure back up uh, the setting, the people, uh, um, your description, which I think is a, it's a pretty accurate one. Uh, so oh, ben, thank you yourself. for the story. Oh, sorry. There we go. There, there's the echo disappears. Okay, go ahead, Rick. <laughs> How many of these have you guys done? Uh, you're now? 153. So by like 400 or so, you'll kind of no, get No, I don't the think so. <laughs> <laughs> like not, the no, tech not even will a little bit. The tech will never be perfect because every day there is some variable change. In this case, uh, I have used this exact tech probably 20 shows. Um, Kate uses, um, but we have a different guest. We have your tech is different. Um, that's probably not what's going on here, but who knows? It changes every day. Um, and so we, um, uh, you know, we try to keep it fluid. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a very funny, we've like, like Ben came up with this like show idea and it has, we've been doing it since March 25th, every single day. And that is just kind of been like a pretty remarkable, um, thing. And, um, we have had bigger 
tech problems? I would say without a doubt. I would say Jack Balkan was one of our biggest tech problems. <laughs> like that was awful. There was 10 minutes that we had to do tech support and Jack is pretty tech savvy, but like I just wouldn't like we couldn't get it to work. Um, but anyways, Rick, it is so great to have you here. Thank you this for joining us. I haven't, I haven't seen you uh, since you de-embedded from Facebook most recently, I think. I know. I actually told the story, I think, when we the crowd asked for you to be invited on. And I was like, oh, yeah. And Ben was surprised that I knew you. And I was like, let me tell you the funny story of how I met Rick Pildes, which is like in this, um, which was in the which was in the workshop at Facebook. And um, that was kind of a funny story. But um, yeah, I'm just super excited to hear your take. I'm interested in to hear like you told me that you had been signed on with CNN. I don't know, like, who, what you're doing with CNN or like what's going on, but like, I'm yeah, just so, super interested so, to hear how you're, what, how you're handling every day. You must be so busy. Well, um, it's kind of uh, funny uh, coming full circle in a sense. So, so back in 2000, uh, was that an airplane? <laughs> oh yeah, that might actually have been an airplane. Okay. House. Anyway, back in two, back in two thousand, when I had first moved to NYU from Michigan Law School, where I began teaching, and the whole Bush v. Gore litigation began to emerge, because I was in New York, I think um, NBC got a hold of me fairly quickly, and they brought me on uh, as their kind of legal commentator uh, for breaking events in the courts, which turned out to be virtually every single day for about thirty five days. And I, I actually had a fantastic experience um, doing that, um, in part because NBC uh, very much let me be an, an independent academic expert. They weren't trying to push me into any kind of a partisan box. They didn't pair me up with partisans. Um, and so that was a very good experience um, because it's sustained conversation. It's not little sound bites. <clears throat> and uh, I haven't really done anything you know, at that level since then and then um cnn just got a hold of me this summer um and has now retained me starting in a week or so as their <coughs> uh academic expert on voting issues in the election through january uh so i think they're anticipating the possibility that we may have issues that go on well past election day but any in any event i'm looking forward to it um you know i've always felt that um it's incredibly important uh when, when it comes to the democratic process, that people have information, access to you know knowledge. In our culture, it's it's become so hard to find people who um, you know are not highly polarized uh, about these issues. Maybe understandably, um, and uh, you know I try to do my best to call the shots straight as I can about the law. Um, and I, you know, hope to bring policy perspective to the issues as well. But in any event, yeah, I'm looking, I'm looking forward to that. We'll see, we'll see how that goes. So one of the things that I wanted to ask you, one of the things that Ben and I have been kind of mulling over a bunch, and like Nate personally, who's been on, has not been able to kind of like talk to us about, is like what the decision desks are going to look like for an election day that stretches into an election month. Like basically, um, with all of like the voting, the vote counting from absentee ballots and mail-in voting, and everything else. And speaking from a perspective of Bush v. Gore is actually perfect because I mean, you you went through that, you lived that. I'm just very curious what you think or like if have you been consulting or talking to any of the major networks about how they're going to report election night? I feel people have gotten into this mode over the last twenty years of. Well, actually, basically 2004, so like four elections um, of expecting results that night or the next day. Yeah, so um, I've been on uh, you know several election task forces over the last several months. Uh, one of the messages that I think has gotten communicated and absorbed, uh, at least by sort of the more mainstream media, um, is. Um, you have to start educating people to understand that we may very well not have a result that they can call on election night. Um, and it may take several days, it may take a week um, until we're in a position to declare uh, the networks uh, a result. Now, just to 
to be clear about this, the networks don't actually declare the winner of the election. That's determined by state officials uh, in a formal process. Yeah. Uh, but we're used to watching the networks declare the winner based on the data they have in the analysis. Um, That's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, I didn't well, want to put you off. Well, um, so I, I think that you are hearing a lot from the major media outlets um, that indicate they understand this and they are actually trying to get people prepared for this. Now, I will say uh, I am not um, sanguine that that's going to be enough uh, to diffuse the uh, sort of worst case scenarios, you know, I can imagine from what might happen with the election. Um, and so I think if it turns out to be the case, which it may not, but if it turns out to be the case that um, one candidate is ahead in the vote on election night when everyone's watching TV or even in the newspapers the next morning when people are looking at the newspapers for numbers, and then over the course of a week, let's say, day by day, that lead arose in key states uh, to the point that the outcome appears to be on the verge of flipping or does flip. I think even with all of the major media telling people, be patient, this is understandable, nothing sinister is going on. I think nonetheless, I agree. the situation will be unbelievably explosive. And so I have been telling my election law colleagues Look, it's it's very appropriate to try to educate the media and and for the media to then try to educate the public to be prepared for something we're not used to, but that's that's just not enough in the context um, that we're in. And and I should say this context today is so dramatically different from 2000 that okay, I don't so think. Okay, so say more about that because I was going to yeah, ask. Well, you. We're I, talking I don't about. Think uh, education, you could say 2000 might be a thing that you would point to in terms of education. But are right. there any other elections in history, tr like tr like Truman v. Dewey? Like, is there anything like that is kind of like that is going to approach this? Well, let me. So since I was involved with the 2000 process, unlike you, uh, Kate. Um, I like, well, I was it was in high school. Well, so, <laughs> that far along, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have actually expected that. But uh, <laughs> but but uh, in 2000, there are so many things that were different. One of the major things that was different, which people don't remember, because history turned out to be different than what people imagined it might be at the time. People did not believe there were huge differences between George W. Bush and Al Gore. In fact. There are lots of complaints during the campaign uh, that this was a Tweedledee, Tweedledum election. And I remember when I was doing all of this commentary about what was happening day by day in the courts, people were incredibly patient. They were actually very interested in the process. Uh, they were not, you know, worked up um, as if nothing would ever be the same if candidate A or candidate B won. Um, so here are the things I think are different today, just to tick off some of them that come quickly to mind. One is many people on both sides view this election as existential, by which I mean uh, it's not a normal election where one side might win, the other side might win, the side that loses, you know, can be content that, okay, we lost this election, but, you know, we can come back and maybe we'll win the next election. There are many people on both sides who believe nothing about the United States will ever be the same again if the other side wins. So politics is at this existential level, number one. Number two, um, many people on both sides are already primed to believe that things are going to be rigged. They, they, they have heard rhetoric about this uh, for a number of, you know, four or five years now. Uh, and uh, they, they, many more people have come to believe that. The level of distrust is enormous going into the election. Uh, number three, um, we didn't have social media um, to any meaningful extent back in yeah. 2000. That's completely you know, I remember trying to communicate. I, I remember when the Supreme Court decided the case on December 12th, that evening, um, when I was having to comment on the decision. Of 2000. In 2000, you couldn't get that decision immediately in front of you on a computer. We had a reporter, you know, on the steps of the Supreme Court, kind of flipping through the pages, these iconic images of Pete Williams from NBC doing that. So social media now uh, 
uh, with, you know, all the things we know about the misinformation, the conspiracy theorizing, the rumor mongering, the way things take off and become viral before real information can catch up. Um, that's a that's going to be a huge accelerant. And we don't have the institutions or we don't have the, the trust in institutions that to a large extent we did have back in 2000. Uh, that there are any kind of, you know, relatively more um, uh, non-politicized institutions that can play a role in helping to resolve this. So by now, the courts have come to be seen, rightly or wrongly, by many people on both sides, state and federal court, U.S. Supreme Court as well, um, as they're, they're seen through the polarized partisan lens that has consumed all of our institutions. Um, and, and so, and then on top of it, you have politicians, you know, leading political figures who are stoking or prepared to stoke these conspiracy theories or, or the, even the theory that, not conspiracy theories necessarily, but there, if there are mistakes, nothing is seen as an innocent mistake. Well, uh, all so of that I makes this such a radically different context than 2000. I want Ben to, 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 to tag in for a second. Um, I think he's got his like mic problem kind of figured out. But there's also I just want to quickly say that like about the social media thing that I completely agree with you that they have teams that have been working on this. I do not know what those teams have come up with that like at all the major social media platforms or what they're kind of deciding to do. It is a very for those social media companies, it's an insanely difficult problem of like, what do they decide is going to be quashing what person speech and what is going to be false news and how do you judge falsity in a split second on a thing that's going viral and all of these questions, things that Rick, we met over um, and those those types of questions, which are incredibly difficult. And I think people really downplay how difficult they are, especially when there are real stakes at hand, like not just a Nancy Pelosi video, but a Nancy Pelosi video like the eve of an election. Um, and something, you know, something like that. And so I just was going to say that I think that everything that you said is right. And so I would love, and you don't have to answer this right now, but at some point I would love if you could answer what your top three, five concerns are for the election, the actual, actual, like just physical problems of, of voting by mail or voting in person, the actual, kind of like the 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 publicity kind of major news network kind of journalist takes that kind of take the wrong take or get like go back and forth between Breitbart and like New York Times or kind of like or whether you're concerned about things like the virality like the like the like this like this kind of like either purposeful or accidental plunge towards like a, a manipulated election I don't, you know, or maybe the election is manipulated. Who the hell knows? Like, ah, <laughs> like, um, I'm just kind of, so that's kind of, it's such, it's such a hard, it's such a hard line to draw. I feel like you're drawing it every day and it's like fascinating, but Ben quickly, like, well, not quickly take all the time you want, but like, yeah. I want you, I'm really interested to hear what your thoughts are on like on Rick's take on 2020. Ah. Actually, before I do, I'd love you to address the question Kate just posed. What, uh, you know, in rough rank order, what are your worries? Uh, yes. So I think uh, we've already kind of talked about the, the issue that I think uh, I fought actually all along. Uh, and right now I still think of it as probably the most explosive issue, the, the issue that has the greatest chance of really destabilizing the election result. Um, and that is um, hundreds of thousands of ballots in key states that cannot be counted for one reason or another uh, until well after election night that change the outcome from what the numbers say on election night or in the paper the next day. And and by the way, I think we would see these leads alone. So just to be clear, just to be clear though, that's not actually a problem unless people perceive it as a problem, right? I mean, yes. you know, if no, we if we have you know, we have lots of states now uh, in which um, the 
you know, the, the, the possibility of that with a large number of votes cast but not counted uh, is there. Um, you know, in the context of uh, people are warned kind of every day that it's there, and yet people may consciously or subconsciously take it as somehow inappropriate that a Kirsten Cinema, Martha McSally, uh, uh, blue uh, blue shift takes place. I actually think, given the uh, current modalities of voting, where the president is really actively urging people not to vote by mail, uh, you could imagine a red shift um, in the sense that there's um, a perception based on the uh, partisan uh, party cast of the early vote that these are are going blue, um, but then um, you know you have a big Trump turnout on election day. Uh, oh, he you muted yourself. We can't hear you. Can't hear you. A big kind Trump of like what election day. election day. Kind of like what happened in Florida and North Carolina in 2016. Mm -hmm. You know where people looked at the early vote and said as they correctly said about Nevada, Hillary's got this in the bag. And the Democratic turnout in early voting then was really impressive. And it wasn't that Republicans weren't voting. It's just that they were voting in person on Election Day. Now you have the president kind of really encouraging that by disparaging vote by mail. Um, and I wonder if people's belief that there is a blue shift after election day because of residual mail votes um, uh, actually might miss the fact that we're all going to have weeks of like in this county there are this many more you know blue absentee voters than, we're, than we expected and so we're seeing the blue wave and then actually a whole bunch of Republicans go vote on election day as by the way is absolutely their right and you know, they're going to vote in roughly the numbers. Uh, you know, the Trump turnout game turned out to be very good four years ago. And so I actually wonder if the bigger risk than a blue shift, which everybody's been being warned about for months, is a kind of surprise election day turnout for Trump that causes a lot of, of Democratic voters to disbelieve in the legitimacy of the of the vote well um i guess a lot of different points to to pick up on there uh so first of all where you started you're certainly right that if people had trust in the process and if we didn't have po political figures and social media prepared uh to delegitimate the vote counting process after election day um there's certainly nothing wrong uh, with ballots being counted after election day, if they are validly cast and come in on time but can't be counted, they may not arrive until after election day in some states and there's still valid votes. If, if we were in a political moment where there was trust and confidence in these processes, um, that would be fine. But I, I think we have to face the reality that that just does not exist. And so that's a, that's, a, that's a perfect I think that that's such a smart and, point. And so I think we have to try to take that into account in the in the way we yes. um, adopt policies, the way we encourage voters to participate. Um, but don't and, you think that there is some trust in the overall process? Like, I feel like people believe in the overall pro and trust the overall process. I think it's become I think it's become it's certainly more fragile than it's ever been in our lifetimes. Okay. Um, and maybe more fragile than it's been. I don't. I don't even know exactly what you'd have to, you know, go back to to uh, the 1790s to the pre Civil War era. Um, I, I think it's a very scary thing. Yeah. Um, and um, especially with the hyperpolarization of our politics and the sort of the tribal nature of politics and this sort of existential feeling about the election, uh, people are very likely to be willing to endorse whatever it takes for their side to win. 
Um, and that includes uh, uh, not having as much kind of commitment to some of the, the norms that, that we've taken for, for granted for a long time. Um, now, on a maybe more positive note, if, if that's the right way to put this, um, you know, everything about the voting process has become so politicized uh, over the course of the, of the last several months since the pandemic began. Um, and that makes it very hard to have discussion uh, about, you know, a number of these different issues. So my view, uh, this is partly a response to Kate, uh, about the message we should be getting to voters now, not, now that people have the right to vote absentee in most states, um, at least 80% of people, I think, at the moment, and, and more may follow, are going to be able to vote by mail if they want to, and they should have that option. But actually, my view is the more people we can encourage to vote in person, the better for the system. And that all of this attention to vote by mail and all of these political controversies about absentee voting and the way in which that's been politicized. So now Republicans who support the president uh, are going to make an effort to vote in person. Uh, Democrats, because this has become a, 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 an issue Democrat support, are much more likely to vote by mail. Uh, and there are a number of problems we have every reason to anticipate with the absentee ballot process, not just the ones we've been talking about with hundreds of thousands of ballots coming in late, uh, but we know that the rejection rate for absentee ballots is significant. And it's yeah. particularly high about people who are voting absentee for the first time. And you know, as we've seen in these recent primaries, um, typically we think of the rejection rate as three, four percent the absentee ballots. It's up to 10% recently in New Jersey. It's even been higher than that in some places. Wow. Now, when you only have 5% of the votes being cast absentee, you know, a rejection rate of 3 or 4%, you know, it's unfortunate, but it's not going to affect the outcome. If you have 60% of the vote cast absentee and 5 to 10% of those are rejected and they could affect the outcome, people aren't going to believe they're being rejected legitimately for good reason appropriate reason. Um, the losing side is, is going to view this as completely sinister and, and you know, nefarious. So can um, I ask and so, yes. yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. Finish. Well, so, so I think, well, I, I do want to stress this because I think this message has not gone out uh, at this point uh, very well and certainly not gone out to, uh, to Democrats or independent voters. Um, I think uh, the surest way we can minimize the various problems that are easy to anticipate with absentee voting is for people to vote in person. And they can vote early in person, as Ben mentioned. It doesn't have to be on election day. And many states have expanded early voting as a result of the virus. Um, but voting in person means you don't have to worry about logistical problems with ballots getting to people on time or being returned in the mail on time. You don't have to worry about these high rejection rates. You don't have to worry about hundreds of thousands being counted after election day. Um, and so, uh, and I think voting in person uh, is, uh, with the protocols they're implementing, um, going to be reasonably safe. In fact, Dr. Fauci, I was glad to see, came out and said that. Um, he's one of the first public health people who said that very strongly. Um, and, and I think I think that's very important for people uh, to hear, especially people who are in swing states uh, where problems with absentee ballots or issues about them, fights about them, um, you know, could really delay getting to a result of the, in the election. Um, you know, keep in mind, Ben, um, it's not just the ballots arriving late, it's that because there are these various procedural things that have to be done with absentee ballots, you know, you have to sign them, people sign them. Uh, they, they do the process of matching your signature to the one you have on the voter registration file. There are issues about, you know, how well that matching goes. In some places, you need a witness to sign the ballot as well. In some places, they need to be notarized. You can do the notary by, by telecom these days, but because of the virus. But in any event, every one of these issues opens up the opportunity for disputes. And of course, if the election seems to turn on the outcome, those disputes are going to be fought to the hilt by both sides. They're going to go to the courts. 
people aren't going to accept the results in the courts if they lose, uh, probably. And, you're, and the delay that this introduces uh, and the divisiveness is very, very concerning to me. And uh, that's why I have been trying now for uh, the last, I don't know, maybe a couple of months to start pushing the importance of in-person voting. Uh, but as I say, that's that because everything is so politicized, um, it's hard to get that message across, except in the way people filter it through a partisan lens. Yeah, totally, totally. And, you know, talk about how that has been received, because it's a challenging idea in this time. Um, you know, I know Nate personally has been, you know, very committed to the idea of vote by mail with these other options, but definitely sort of front foregrounding uh, vote by mail as as a as a preferred option. What is have you been kind of a skunk at the garden party when you say, hey, we really got to focus on on the in-person voting as well? Um, you know, I, you know, I don't I don't think so. Um, uh, there was a, a very, very powerful column written on this. Uh, in the New York Times, I'm uh, I'm afraid I may mispronounce his name. You guys probably know how to pronounce it. I've never said it out loud. Um, is it Jamel? Uh, Jamel Bowie. Yes. Yep. Um, he wrote yeah. a very strong column making this argument. Uh, maybe. Yes, I saw this. Ago. I actually thought of you and Nate when I yeah, saw this. Yeah, and I, so I, 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 so I thought that. that was a very good sign um, that a, a publication like that with a, a prominent columnist like that uh, is recognizing this. And uh, uh, certainly if you talk uh, to the campaigns, which I do from time to time, I think um, many people understand this. Uh, but but getting that message out is, by the way, this is an important thing I should mention. Michelle Obama, uh, in her speech at the convention, um, did say this. Uh, I'm not sure she said it so forcefully that it really sunk in. Uh, and I don't have the language right uh, at hand, but she said we should vote in person and vote early or something like that. I did see that. I saw that quote. It was something like she was like, you can still vote in person. It's like, and that's still the best way to express your vote. Uh, something, Yeah, something like that. And I, I thought that was a signal moment that within the Democratic Party, uh, there is more conversation about this and that some leading figures in the party are um, now trying to say this. Now, I don't know how broadly that message will penetrate before the election, and I don't know how comfortable people will end up feeling. You know, keep in mind, I, I wrote a piece with a couple of top uh, epidemiologists on, on some of this about voting in person. You know, keep in mind you're gonna be dis socially distanced while you're waiting in line. And a lot of these lines are gonna be outdoors rather than indoors uh, at, the, at the polling places. Uh, but when you go in to vote at the polling booth, you're next to somebody for two minutes or three minutes. Uh, it's like not like totally that. different than being at the grocery you're, store. Yeah, you're facing forward. Um, you're not talking to each other. Um, there is some kind of divide between you. Now, in some places, you know, it doesn't extend above your chest, but in some places, it's, it's, it actually does extend uh, if they have curtains, for example, uh, even to your, your face. Um, and I, I think we know from the epidemiologists that um, the duration of exposure uh, to somebody who's infected uh, is very, very significant uh, in whether you are likely to get infected yourself or even how severe the infection is if you do get infected. Um, and in fact, when the CDC or when, when contact tracing is done, they don't even, as I understand it, they don't do contact tracing unless you've been in contact for 15 minutes or more with someone. Mm -hmm. So you're not yeah. going to be, yeah. you're not going to be next to someone for 15 minutes in the polling booth. Um, so I actually think there's very good reason to believe uh, that, that the health risk uh, of in-person voting under the conditions it's going to be conducted will be actually quite minimal. And by the way, we haven't mentioned, most people will be wearing, wearing masks when they go to vote. Um, you know, for people who don't wear masks, um, it may be that there needs to be a, maybe a separate area for voting or something like that. Um, 
but uh, there'll be a high level of mask wearing among people who go to the polls. Uh, won't be anywhere close to 100%. Um, so anyway, that's that's a, a, a long way of coming back to the point that if, if I could do one thing at this point uh, to reduce the risks I see, it would be to get people to vote in person by voting early or in person on election day. That's that's great. I'm going to, yeah, I'm like, I'm writing that down. Um, Am I the only one drinking wine, by the way? No, I'm drinking. I was, I was told that... Um, you know, yeah. this could be like, yeah. like like the way I yeah. teach by Zoom. I could just drink the whole time. I mean, you just pour That's it into a, a seltzer can. Don't drink while I teach. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have a question from the audience. Um, David, not Daniel. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, really interesting, uh, fascinating about uh, promoting in-person voting. Um, one of the observations that many people have come to over the last three and a half years is that democracy is neither guaranteed nor inevitable. So what are the two or three suggestions that you would offer to ordinary citizens of actions that they can take in the near term to preserve or enhance democratic institutions? Wow, that's um, such a compelling question. Uh, and I wish uh, I had uh, a couple of easy answers to that. Um, you know, obviously the first thing I'm gonna say is get out and vote. Uh, uh, be politically engaged enough uh, to, um, you know, try to hold people in power accountable. Um, but there, there's a whole range of, of ways of doing that. Um, but I will say that, you know, as you kind of intimated in your, in your comments, um, we have forgotten how much a democratic system or a constitutional democracy inevitably depends not just on formal rules and formal statutes, but on all sorts of uh, cultural commitments to the democratic process, norms, people sometimes refer to them as the infrastructure of democracy. And I think those can take a long time to establish, uh, but it's very disturbing how quickly they can come unraveled. Um, and you know we have certainly not just in the united states but in the western democracies in europe and not and, and even more so in the ones in eastern and central europe um you know we have seen uh how much stress uh these uh necessary commitments uh, to democracy are are now under um and i don't know that there's there's any easy way to put them back together for example social media you know, I think it's a significant contributor to that. Um, but we can't put the genie back in the bottle about social media. I agree with what Kate said, which is um, I don't uh, I don't think the social media companies, you know, even if they <laughs> get more aggressive um, in content moderation, I, I don't think they can make a major dent in this fundamental underlying uh, issue about how social media affects democratic political culture. It's um, just the nature of the tool. It's like now yeah. it exists and there's only so there, much there, you can do. There was, there was, there were a lot of virtues in having gatekeepers. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a, obviously there's a lot of benefit also in people being able to bypass gatekeepers uh, when gatekeepers are exercising those powers in, in inappropriate ways. But, you know, when you take all of that, all those mediating structures, and all those mediating institutions apart and, and you know, can bypass them as immediately as is, as is now possible uh, with the effects that we see. You know, obviously there are very good uh, effects from social media in terms of, of enhancing democratic uh, participation and discussion, but, but there, are a lot of, there are a lot of very bad effects and um, I, I, I don't see how we, how we really get a handle on it's truly like the two sides of two Madison. Two sides of Madison. 
Uh, I think like the two points of him both embracing democracy and republicanism or like debasing, like like debasing democracy over and like championing republicanism as a solution to kind of the base of democracy. And then like at the same time later in his life, like kind of like being like, oh, no, there are too many gatekeepers. We need to make it more democratic. That's a solution. It's a very funny thing to kind of watch. It's like it's a very funny thing to watch play out. We have another question from um, Daniel, but for some reason we cannot get him raptured in. So I'm just going to read it. Um, How is the degradation of expertise? Well, this is actually around the gatekeeping thing. How is the degradation of expertise contributed to the democratic dysfunction in the U S if at all? How do we we rebuild trust in technocrats? Um, (laughs) Um, So I absolutely think that's a a fundamental cultural phenomenon uh, that's taken place, uh, not just in the last, you know, four or five years, but over a period of time, not just in the United States, but in other democracies too, probably even more so here. Um, There's always been a tension in democratic political culture between the role of um, popular participation and the role of, I I don't know if I even like the term, but let's use it, you know, elites of various sorts, uh, political leaders, uh, experts uh, in various uh, uh, arenas. Um, uh, but we are at a point uh, where um, culturally the idea of genuine expertise, the idea of experience or value in experience, the idea of kind of knowledge for many years on, on working on certain issues, all of that has become greatly delegitimated. I'll give you one example. Um, I think uh, the development of independent central banks has been one of the healthier things that's happened to democracies in the 20th century. Um, I think there's almost no chance uh, if we were discussing this issue on a blank slate today that we would be able to uh, create uh, the Federal Reserve. Uh, <laughs> I, I just do not think it would happen. Uh, ben and is I, like so enthusiastically nodding. So enthusiastically nodding. Yeah. Yeah. We. Unmute. Sorry, Ben, I can't hear you. We wouldn't be able to create the Federal Reserve. We wouldn't be able to create. Can you imagine creating the Federal Communications Commission where we say, you know, hey, five or six people do what's ever in the public interest regarding uh, regarding uh, communications. Right. No chance of that. Um, we would never be able to create uh, an independent, uh, a genuinely kind of independent consumer enforcement FTC, right, which has, you know, people forget this about the FTC, but they can kind of sue anybody on the basis of something as vague as unfair trade practices, right? Um, These are And then that's before you get to, oh, a a general criminal enforcement jurisdiction vested in an entity like uh, the FBI, which has a single political employee uh, appointee. Um, You know, the the amount of trust in in technocratic institutions it took to create these was astonishing. Yeah, and, and of course, we learned that there were problems, you know, with some of these institutions. And there was, you know, the issue of regulatory capture by the regulated interests. And these these were problems. But what we have done is jump all the way to the extreme alternative conclusion, uh, which is that none of this is of value. Uh, uh, you know, uh, we can't trust any of these uh, actors or institutions. Let me let me mention this. This is, goes a little bit back to the first question. This will be a really uh, contrary to um, widespread opinion view, um, but I have said it in print more or less. Um, what do you think the most radical change we've made to the American democratic system in the last 50 years or so is? Oh, wait, this sounds I mean, like a poll. Well, sorry. I'll, I'll, I mean, I... If you want to take we do, a we do a poll, we do a with... daily poll. So this actually sounds yeah. like it could be clever. Oh. What do you, what do you think the options are? Oh, in answer to that uh, question. Well, I, now this puts me in a difficult position because I know what answer I want to give, 
That's um, okay. We've so let have, the polls be biased. Think, biased. <laughs> I know exactly how to do this. I know okay, how to ex- wait, 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 wait. If if we talk over each other, then you're gonna get the echo. Because I gotta be muted when you talk. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna say Rick Rick thinks the most radical democratic experiment. Democratic experiment in the last 50 years is what do you think it is i've seen some of the chapters so i want to take one thing off the table which i understand people might offer some people say the voting rights act and of course that's a huge significance but that's more than 50 years ago i I I bet i can guess that's 1965. oh no you haven't okay crap Okay, so that's oh, so the voting rights act is off the table. Off ben, the table. okay, are you gonna okay, come up with a bunch of options? Well, no, because we can do it as a bunch of options, or we can ask people whether they agree with you, and then they we can see whether. They won't agree with me. All right, let's give options. Um, Rick, list five options, including yours, but don't list yours uh, in any known order. I hope I can even come up with five. Uh, so let me let me offer a few. Um, uh, the end of the fairness doctrine in media. Uh, the regulation of campaign finance or Supreme Court decisions. Citizens United. The regulation of campaign finance. Yes. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, the, the shift to um, uh, using primaries to choose the presidential nominee as opposed to the convention system, which existed until the seven. Um, let's see. Um, let's see. Um, uh, partisan gerrymandering. The, 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 the rise of partisan gerrymandering. And um, if I got the five, I'm at the four. One more. One more? I have to come up with one more? Oh, come on. You, you changed this You guys want to throw anything into the hopper? <laughs> Just imagine Just you're imagine being you're hammered, hammered by people. By people. In a law professor professor meeting, meeting, and they're just like yelling at you, like, like, your thesis thesis is wrong. wrong. What is the actual extra extra thing that they throw at you? you? Um, let's see. see. I don't know. Let's say Bush v. Gore. Gore. Um, um, I'm sure there are others. others. Um, Let's say the role of the courts in politics, which has changed dramatically since the 1960s and certainly continuing for the last 50 years. Sure. Yes. I was kind of thinking of that epitomized by Bushy Gore. Gore. But yeah. But yeah. Okay. Now I want to see this poll. I'm excited. (laughs) I'm, and I have no idea. You did a good job, Rick, of like, you just like you just like listed them. You, I have no idea what your actual <laughs> feelings are on it. I totally know which one Rick thinks kind, is the. I kind of do too. Ben probably knows. Let's see. Um, um, all right, I'm gonna loose this poll on the world, and I'm gonna mute myself until I do. Six, Talk six, among six, amongst six, yourselves. Okay. Okay. Um. Um. Oh, Rick, just as a side note, and because this is somewhat like a cocktail party, I should introduce you to Will Codrington. Do you know him? He was at the Brennan Center. Do you know him? Um, I think I recognize the name, but I don't think He just I don't started think at Brooklyn me. as a law professor. Teaching oh, really? Law. Oh, that's yeah. great. And anyways, I should introduce you to him at some point. He's a college okay. friend of mine. He's been on in lieu of fun. Um, but I've been meaning to tell you that for a while. So, <laughs> like, now. <laughs> um, good good time. <laughs> yeah. Um, what is, is you've the, now delayed long enough? You should have an answer. I know we don't have an answer. We don't have the poll yet. Ben's fixing. Oh, type I thought you were going to give an answer. You were going to yep. choose. Among oh, the I can't choose until the poll is unleashed in the public. Oh, and then they like give the Okay. So now the poll's live. Uh, okay. I mean, so you are voting for the one that you think is the most radical, not the one that you think Rick thinks is the most radical. Okay. Well, I voted um, for both. I voted for both. I agree with Rick. I agree with Rick. <laughs> so far, a big, uh, a, a, a significant uh, win for uh, a shift to primary elections is running ahead. Partisan gerrymandering is making a play for it. It is getting ready to pull ahead here. We're just prepping. Partisan gerrymandering. Third, 
is they are neck and neck. Shift to the polls with 17. Partisan gerrymandering is pulled ahead at 20. <laughs> 21. 20. People are vacillating in their votes. I think people are doing that on purpose. Oh, <laughs> uh, shift to primary. It is a tie. Oh, and yeah, well, it's pretty close. It's really kind much. of a tie. Um, should I should, should I, I say what I think? What I, what I think, think my, my what was yeah, your vote, what Ben? Was your vote, ben? Well, I don't no. get to vote. I, I literally don't get to vote. Well, what do you think? But Rick's vote is. Oh, and Rick clearly believes it's the shift to primary elections. Yes. Yes. I'm I'm right behind that with partisan gerrymandering, frankly. I actually don't believe that partisan gerrymandering is a reform of the last 50 years. Um, it is, after all, named for Mr. Elbridge Jerry. Um, oh, well, yeah. that would be like, yeah, I would, know, just you, have particularly, I would just you have a particularly sophisticated, you know, audience, of course. Audience, of course. I, I think most people, I think most people take for granted, take for granted that, that, that the way we that have chosen presidential nominees since the 1970s is just the way a democracy does this. Uh, what other way could you do this? Um, and in fact, uh, for 175 years or so in American history, uh, we always used a very different process, um, one which most democracies actually use in one form or another. Um, and it may take too long to explain it properly here, but in, in this political convention system, um, in the 20th century, we did have a certain number of primary elections, but there were never enough delegates chosen that way that you could become the nominee simply by winning primaries. So you had to also be able to appeal to the party figures, national, state, local party figures who were chosen to be at the convention. It was sort of a combination of appealing to the outside path through primaries directly to voters and a more inside path through people who, who had experience with this person, um, who had a sense of uh, how well they could uh, work with other political figures, um, how good they were at governing, you know, all of these kinds of matters. And they had, they had to be, you know, relatively faithful to the party's commitments. Um, once we got rid of that, uh, in the aftermath of the, you know, sort of catastrophic 1968 Democratic Convention and the war, the anti-war movement, and the aftermath, um, uh, and and candidates could go directly to the voters with this is an elimination of one of these filtering devices, the convention, in part because of the delegitimation of the the, the value that was contributed by elected political figures, you know, participating in this choice. Um, Things like celebrity status, name recognition, money, you know, all these things became much more important resources. Yes. And it became possible for figures. Um, and actually, Donald Trump is the, the kind of ultimate example of this. You know, figures who have no uh, experience in government, um, no experience, you know, as some of the figures did who were chosen through the convention process, like Dwight Eisenhower. You know, no experience of running massive organizations uh, like the U.S. military, um, and uh, in many ways, no, no really strong commitment to the philosophy of, of the party. Um, and and you could you know turn you could take the party label hostage for your own purposes. Um, and uh, that's because of this change that was made in the 1970s to the selection process. And, and this is actually an incredibly important it's part of democratic institutional point. design, but we never really focus on it in that way because it's not like a formal institution. It's not a, a rule. Um, it's something that people also people take for granted because every exactly. four years or six years, they come to, to a to process new again, and they just listen to what they're told. They just kind of like to, oh, this well, is how you it, do it. You take it for, you, look, it, maybe it's right on balance. You know, that's a debatable question, of course. But it does have consequences for the kinds of candidates uh, who run, because people won't run if you know if they know they have to get the approval of both voters and and party figures. Some people just not run. Um, 
you know, we didn't have, you didn't have like 15 to 20 people pursuing the office because there were these filtering mechanisms, you know, it came down to three or four people and, and like, you know, Jack Kennedy, you know, had to win primaries in a place like West Virginia to prove he was credible, he could be elected. But he also had to win the support of party Democratic figures throughout the country, uh, which he did. Um, and, um, you know, I don't think this genie can be put back in the bottle. Um, there, there are modifications we could make to build back in a little bit of more of a role for, for um, uh, the party figures, national, state, uh, and local. Um, uh, Elaine Kamerick is actually uh, one of the real experts on this. At, at, Elaine's at Brookings, right? Uh, am I right about that? Um, uh, and she's written very interesting things uh, about how to build a little bit of a role back in for <coughs> For party figures, but you know, fundamentally, uh, it, it's unlikely this is going to change. Um, but it's a it has huge, huge consequences, and we just mostly don't think about it because we just take for granted that it's natural. This is the way we do it. Um, who would ever think of doing it differently? Yeah, yeah. There is a huge. Uh, there's a cluster of people at Brookings, actually, as you know, Rick, who work on these issues. Uh, John Rausch, who uh, has been a frequent guest on In Lieu of Fun, uh, wrote a, a, a set of papers about what he calls political realism uh, that is all about the decline of party uh, influences. Um, and, um, and of course, my colleague Bill Galston it famously said, that the only real problem with the smoke-filled room was the amount of tobacco smoke. Um, uh, uh, and of course, Elaine as well. So there's, uh, there's actually my section at Brookings, the governance studies section. I am actually one of the odd ducks who does not work on strengthening political parties. Um, but uh, 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 yeah, so we have uh, time for one more question and then we got to wrap up. Uh, we uh, ask the disembodied voice of Andrew McMahon to uh, uh, give the final question. Hi, Rick. So uh, got a very, very quick one for you. So um, I've heard, I don't know how many times now people say, oh, well, it's, it's good that people are scared. That, 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 that'll make them vote. And I, I kind of don't really, I don't really agree with that. Um, just want your take on that. And then also... Kate and Ben, I don't know if you guys know Eric Segal um, and Chris Green, two law professors, but they're interested in coming on in lieu of fun. <laughs> All right, I'll add them to the list, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> if At some lucky. point. They can Much get behind fun. Rick in his second his thought. second time on in lieu of fun. <laughs> um, well, you know, um, people are motivated to vote by all sorts of things. Um, it takes some effort to get out and vote. It, it, it involves some some cost of time and effort, especially in our system where election day isn't a holiday and it's on a weekday. Um, and uh, uh, as the political scientists know, um, anger uh, that can be related to fear or being scared. Uh, anger is a very powerful motivator for getting people to turn out and vote and, and fear of the consequences if they don't, uh, and of the alternative. Uh, and so obviously it's a very dangerous thing when politicians stoke fear to mobilize voters, um, if they stoke fear you know, along uh, really ugly lines, which certainly happens, it's very common in democratic politics. Um, but you know, people, are, people are motivated to participate by optimism and positive things. They're also motivated by negative things, including fear and anger. Um, and I, I, I think that that's, I don't know, an inherent part of democratic politics. It just should not be stoked uh, along ugly lines. Um, but if you're afraid of what's going to happen, if these policies rather than those get adopted, that, that can be a very powerful motivator. And there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, absolutely. Rick, this was an awesome and very fast uh, <laughs> Uh, hour and five like now we're like an hour and 10 minutes but like 
honestly, because we, you know, we make the rules, it can go as long as it wants, and <laughs> we're making it all up as we go, so it's fine. <laughs> so, like, I think you guys have this... figured out the perfect gig. You don't even have to buy me my drink. I kind of like that was the whole point. I know how much that glass of wine. That's why we designed it this way. (laughs) It was entirely a money saving thing. You know, if we had it at a bar or something, we'd give each other coronavirus and we'd be on the hook for your drink. It's 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 just not the way we wanted to do it this way. We don't even pay for your Zoom. No, and you can put in my face. Or your, you your internet in connection. The fact that I'm trapped in an apartment in New York City. I see your your backgrounds of your shingled, you know, the decks oh, no. you both come, on. Oh, no. Come, come. No, this is beautiful. He has a beautiful, I have a beautiful view, too. But, like, come to Cape Cod whenever you want. Uh, you can always come here. We have a upstairs with two bedrooms. <laughs> lovely. And no one goes there except people that we don't like or want to talk to. So I'm just kidding. Well, this is, this is a lot of fun. Rural Virginia. It's a it's a seventy percent Trump county where uh, there are more Confederate flags in this immediate area than Biden signs, um, what, and what uh, Shenandoah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, uh, I suspect it'll be probably Biden will do a little better than Hillary did in Shenandoah County, but I'm not sure of that. But what was uh, that? The, what was that? Uh, Hillary got twenty nine percent. <laughs> Trump got 69, 70%. Um, and, um, uh, but you can, when, when, you know, when Trump people talk about the enthusiasm gap, um, you know, it's obviously not a representative sample, but boy, is it dramatic. Uh, uh, when you get off the highway in Shenandoah County, it is, uh, uh, you know, whether there's a hidden Biden vote here that's just not showing lawn signs, but... It is a, I mean, it's a remarkable display of the base. Not, um, uh, I counted on the way from the highway to my cabin uh, this afternoon when we drove in, and it was literally a ten to one ratio. Uh, and the libertarian had as many signs as Biden did, and there were, you know, and there were definitely more Confederate flags than Biden signs. So, you know, to anyone who thinks the the Trump effect in rural America is overstated, um, take a drive. Um, drive. You know, it's a great great piece piece of long long advice. advice. Like going into the election, I think it's like if you want to see what people are thinking and people are voting, I'll never forget in 2004, I'd worked on the Kerry campaign and obviously Kerry lost and there was like uh, and I was in college and there was like this whole thing and people and I just remember people like being like no one I know voted for 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 Bush how could this be happening and I had come from a very conservative part of this uh, of like of America a very conservative part and to be and to hear kind of these liberals kind of all around me which I had identified would be like we don't know anyone I was like oh like yeah, let me tell you all about people who vote for like people you don't like. There is just there's a lot of them. So you know, just I don't mean I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't keep you, but I guess who cares? People can leave. Um, yeah, exactly. So just just a little anecdote. So um, in 2016, um, I was um, working uh, a sort of monitoring polling places in Pennsylvania uh, from a data center. And uh, everyone was focused on the the concerns about these extremely long lines that were expected in Philadelphia, which existed. Um, But over the course of the day, um, we started noticing very, very long lines in Lucerne County in Pennsylvania, you know, a, a relatively more rural county. And the media was not picking up on this because they they weren't out there in Lucerne County. Uh, but you could see these incredibly long lines of rural voters, um, many of whom who had not voted in pre- the last couple of elections, uh, who were showing up. Um, and so it's a it's a very big country um, with a lot of uh, a lot of diversity. Um, diversity. And uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, Ben, do you want to sign us off or do you want me to? You can point. I guess uh, since I'm unmuted, 
Uh, I will do it. Rick, it's been a pleasure to see you again. Let's not let's not let it go this long again. Uh, tomorrow, folks, uh, we have uh, Margaret uh, Taylor and maybe Quinta Jurassic. I'm not sure, uh, from Lawfare coming on to talk about our mammoth project, uh, summarizing what can you reasonably say about collusion based on the SSA, SSCI report. Um, so that'll be fun for the collusion nerds. Um, and uh, until then, that'll happen 22 hours and 46 minutes from now. And until then, Kate. Oh man, you still you still kicked it over to me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were gonna handle it. I like tuned out. Okay. We don't have fun we anymore. We don't have fun anymore. So, so in lieu of in fun, lieu of fun we, very we very literally have shifted to primary, shifted elections, to primary elections as a radical democratic experiment. Democrat experiment. <laughs> and it sucks. And it sucks. <laughs> See you tomorrow. Bye. <laughs> thank you guys a lot. That was really, really fun. I enjoyed it a lot. Enjoyed it a lot. And Ben, thanks so much for that story at the start. It was great to be reminded of that.